Rashid Ben Yahya was a 19-year-old British teenager with a big smile on his face, an A-list student who loved to play football, an engineering apprentice who once built his own computer. He was a brother to four sisters and nurtured into a beloved family in Birmingham. His mother, Nicola Ben Yahya, revealed he was brainwashed in 2014 by people who instructed him to the letter to join ISIS and travel to fight in Syria in Iraq. In May 2015, he traveled to Syria. Just five months later, after arriving in the war-torn region, he was killed in a coalition drone strike. Hanif Qadir, a reformed Al-Qaeda member, has dedicated his life to raising awareness against extremism through the Active Change Foundation in London, a grassroots sanctuary he founded with the aim of preventing gang involvement, youth violence, radical ideas and supporting young people's emotional well-being to develop their resilience so they don't fall prey to recruiters who skillfully radicalise youth like Rashid. Hanif invited me today to watch Nicola speak to a number of teenagers at his centre as she shares her son's story to warn them of the dangers of radicalisation. After she launched Families for Life, a confidential counselling service specifically aimed at families or friends who have been affected by radicalisation. Rashid had come from a family where he was incredibly close to us. He loved his father dearly, he loved me, he had a very close relationship with me and he loved his four sisters. Um, and then my husband and me had these difficulties. And unfortunately my husband moved out for a little while for us so we could almost sort things out. And it was during this period he became quiet because he was trying to reconcile in his mind what was going on in his life and it was at this point I think somebody came along and introduced him to radicalization or those kind of ideas um, it was somebody I'm pretty certain within the community who befriended him um, and so over that it was about a year year and a half period um, they weren't consecutive changes, they weren't one after one changes where you could say, okay, this is happening, this is happening. There was a change here and then it would, there'd be nothing and then another change. I didn't know at the time, but the headset came in and I thought he was just gaming and talking to people on his headset because that's what people do, you know, young lads do. But he wasn't, I think he was actually, in hindsight now, I kind of realised he was probably not just gaming, particular games um, with these their, their own games that um, these terrorist groups kind of have but also he was talking he was in dialogue with somebody and he didn't want us to hear he suddenly had this round about Christmas time he had this absolute surge of energy um, and he came home and he was going back to his football he was doing his free running all over the place he he came home one day and he actually put, um, I came home and on my pillow was a, a card and it just had a, um, a little present with it and it was a diamond necklace that he'd bought me. And the, it, the, the note he wrote just said um, to Mama, all the diamonds and all the gems in the world will never make up for you, um, for what you are to me. And um, I remember saying to him, why have you got me this? Because I thought, you know, I, I don't understand this, it's not my birthday yet. And he, he, his simple answer was, he just went, just. At the time, I didn't really understand it, but I knew. I thought, why has he got me a present? He got his dad a present, and he got his little sister a present. Um, I was later going to understand what that present was, and the surge of energy as well was because actually what happens is when they get them so low and really lethargic, they then are so confused and really are in this dilemma that the the recruiters or the, the rad, they come along with a solution and the solution to that problem that they've got or the confusion is to actually go to Syria or to carry out some sort of attack. What happened was um, within a few months he then disappeared and never came home. He went to work and never came home in the evening and within 10 minutes I knew something drastic, I, I knew something had happened because that wasn't like Rashid. Rashid would, would always, always text me or phone me even if, if he was going to, if he told me he was going to be home a certain time, if he was 10 or 15 minutes late, he would always, always text me. Every time he spoke to me, I could hear somebody, there was, a, there was always somebody around him and they were, moni they were always monitored, that, especially the foreign fighters, because they, can't, they don't want to risk anybody kind of obviously um, sort of 
sort of leaving or kind of getting out um, too much information. It was really difficult because I would have these conversations with him, but I remember one day he went offline for a few days and I started panicking again. The sickness came in again. And I thought, oh my God, what's happened? And at that time, um, they were starting to really bombard with bombs and drones. And then after a few days, he got in touch with me and then he said to me, I said, where have you been in a panic? I said, where have you been, where have you been? And he said, oh, he said, we couldn't communicate because they were, they were you know, shelling us and stuff. And um, he then said to me, you know, um, they were really, it was, they were shelling really bad on the weekend. And then he said, it was that bad. He said, they actually, and it, it's really hard to actually listen um, to your child on the other line saying how they had to run. They could hear the shaft opening to the drone and they had to literally run. After listening to what she had to say, one of the things that kind of struck me was kind of how sort of down to earth and brave she was saying it. Um, especially since it only ha happened so recently, I didn't expect her to sort of come out and re be really open about it quite confidently. And that was something that quite, quite, quite well struck me. I felt that um, it was, it was certainly interesting listening to it, but at the same time it was um, sort of empowering. I felt what Nicola said was very empowering and she was very brave in how she spoke about, considering her circumstances and how, um, how she's lost her son and her experiences. And I think that has made me very aware of what radicalisation can do. I think I felt very sad about the situation and how um, just a normal person that I would probably, normally I would probably know of someone, um, that could go through such a thing and um, who was a victim in the situation and how um, many people and how ISIS or like many radicalization like type of groups they do this to people and normal people and how um, they affect people and how they change people's lives just by giving them something that has not turned out to be true. Nicola, if you could say one thing to your son if he was here now, what would you say? I, um, I never think about what I would say to my son but I do think about if he was here now and what he would say to me. I know without doubt knowing my son, how he was, he would probably realise what he'd done wrong and say, I'm sorry, Mama, because um, that was something he always quite often did. Um, so I know certainly what he would say. But I think certainly for me, I think I don't think about what I would say to him. All I want is because he never said goodbye to me. Um, I never had a goodbye when he left our house on that day and I never said goodbye when he died. I think sometimes I just want, I think I, I sometimes yearn for just to touch him um, and just hold him in my hands and that's it. I think not keep it to yourself, absolutely pick up the phone and speak to somebody um, because they really need to kind of um, be believed and listened to um, because that's the first step of actually getting the help and the intervention that the person needs. Without that first step of reaching out and, and trying to trust somebody, um, then you're on a very slippery slope and the consequences can be dire where it ends in somebody's life like my son. Approximately 850 people from the UK have travelled to support or fight for ISIS in Syria and Iraq, according to a report released by the British authorities in 2017. Birmingham, Rashid's hometown, was the birthplace of Britain's first suicide bomber, the residence of a financier of the September 11 attacks, and the place where Al-Qaeda hatched a plot to blow up a commercial airline in 2006. It is Britain's second biggest city behind London and has a Muslim population of 234,000. I think first and foremost, it's, it's important to understand that in our opinion, in our view, the caliphate or the ISIS you know, uh, network is shrinking. It's actually growing rapidly. Um, and they are networking right across the, uh, the Middle East and the Islamic world. But what uh, countries and communities need to do, uh, especially with regards to countries and the institutions, is to invest in the communities and the community groups. This by far cannot be tackled by policing and security on military action alone. So there are a number of success stories that the Active Change Foundation has worked with. Uh, the interventions that we do, and uh, one of those individuals is a, is a gentleman by the name of Abrar Mirza, um, who was uh, arrested for the plotting and planning to um, blow up or burn down the publishers uh, of the book, it was called The Jewel in Medina, uh, a number of defendants with him. Uh, with him, we, you know, we worked with him when he got released from prison. Obviously, when you're in prison, you, you go through a number of different other issues and you come out more extreme than you, than you were when you went in. With him, we worked with him for over a year and a half, two years, and we managed to sort of mentor him in a way where he's now part of mainstream. He's now part of the business community in, in, in London. 
you know, he's, he's a thriving entrepreneur. Uh, he's doing very well successfully. He's, uh, he runs the London Beer Oil Company. Um, he's married, he's got kids. And he's moved way uh, you know, ahead in terms of his thinking, you know, a radical mindset and an ideology. Nicola is determined that Rashid's death will not have been in vain. Understanding the tactics that terrorist groups use to brainwash and groom vulnerable individuals is key. Being able to spot the signs and knowing where to go for help is hugely important. Nicola believes that if she had the knowledge then that she has today, the outcome may well have been different. Today has shown the human side, the tragic consequences of radicalisation, and we must all be on our guard.